Hey Sherwood family, good evening. It's uh, good to see all of you. Thanks for joining us. And those of you who may, may, may not be a part of our Sherwood family, we appreciate you uh, joining us as well. And uh, what we're going to be doing for the next several weeks is uh, something kind of cool. We're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to have some interviews. And uh, this, this evening is an interview I've got with our brother Tim Dobbs here. Uh, my plan is to interview him and also interview Taryn and also interview all the elders. And the whole thing behind it is we want y'all to understand us and know us a little bit better, uh, kind of become a bit more intimate with us and, and uh, just open up our minds and our hearts to y'all so you can kind of see what we think about things or uh, what kind of uh, relationship we have with the Lord and, and with the Word of God in the church. That's kind of the plan here. So, so I've got some questions for Tim. Uh, we're going to be going through these questions, and he's going to be answering them to the best of his ability. And, uh, and we'll be finished, all right? So, Tim, glad to have you here, man. Good to be here, too. This is going to be uh, fun for me and you. Yeah, it really is. So <laughs> here's my first question for you, Tim. What is your favorite Bible verse and why? That's a tough one because, you know, we love the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as preachers, you know, we love it all. But I thought of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But then... I thought of First John three sixteen. It's a lot like it. It's a lot like it. Yeah. It's a companion verse to it. I just want to share with you why I like it so much. It kind of capsulizes the whole big picture of, of everything, really. But it starts out in First John three sixteen. This is how we know what love is. I mean, we don't know what love is by the movies, right? Or the media, or a lot of times, you know, from people. Mm -hmm. But this is how we can really know what true love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So there's three things there about love that I want to quickly mention why I love it so much. Uh, Jesus Christ laid down, which suggests voluntary action. Yep. So love is voluntary. We do it because we want to love, and Jesus died on the cross because he wanted to lay his life down. It's voluntary action. Laid down his life which when he gave his life, he gave 100%. He gave all he had. So love is volunteering to give 100% to help another person out. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we're just sinners. Yeah. And in the book of Romans, we're told, you know, while we were sinners and ungodly, he died for us. That's right. So love is even giving 100% to loved ones and even enemies. It's just such a powerful verse. But then it gives our responsibility and our part, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So it talks about Jesus' love for us. He died on the cross for us. But now we're morally obligated as Christians to do the same thing. Yeah. Give that 100% if we need to to save a brother or sister. So it's a powerful verse, one of my favorites. It speaks about God, speaks about us. That's right. And you sound like a preacher, man. Take one verse and break it down to three points. That's very preacher of you, you know? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've preached that verse many, many times. Oh, Probably okay. more than any other verse. Uh, if I'm traveling or something that I preach, I just love preaching that passage. You need to have a sermon in your back pocket, <laughs> you know? That's right. Uh, that's always good to have. Okay, well, hey, what's your favorite book of the Bible and why? That was a hard one, too. Mm -hmm. But if for some reason, you know, I was going on a desert island or, or in prison, and they said, you can only have one book. Yeah. I thought, uh, just one of the Gospels. Okay. The Gospels, that section of all the Gospels, because it's all about Jesus, and it doesn't get any better than that. When a, a new convert comes to me and says, how do I start? What do I, what do I need to start reading the Bible? I always say, start with the Gospels, because yeah. it's all about Jesus. People who have been a Christian for 50 years may ask me, hey, I'd like to do some Bible study. Where should I start? Read the Gospels. It's just, you know, all about Jesus. I remember I became a Christian at 21, had never opened the Bible ever. And the preacher there that converted and baptized me said, just go home and start reading one of the Gospels. And so I was reading it for the first time, and I just wept. Oh, man. Because it's just that powerful, yeah. the Gospels. And Jesus is the heart and center of it all. You're right. You're right. I like it. So any one of the Gospels. Any one of the Gospels. You know, and it's funny because I'm, I'm kind of the same way. If anybody asks me, especially somebody who is trying to become a Christian or, you know, just trying to get closer to God, the first thing I always tell them is go to the Gospel of John. That's right. And that's why I Gospel it. of belief. Yeah, that's right. Gospel of belief. Powerful. I wrote these things to you so that you may believe. John that's right. 20, 
You know, I love it. Absolutely. You know, sometimes I'll say, go ahead with Genesis too, you know, but at the same time, be reading through Genesis, be reading through the Gospels as yeah. well. Yeah. Get a you, good balance. You know, you get to see a lot about Jesus in the Gospel of John. Uh, there's a lot of theology there with him being God and, and him being him at the same time. But also, uh, here's who I am. I'm the, I'm the great shepherd. That's I'm right. The, I'm the door. I'm mm -hmm. the gate. You know, I'm, I'm the living water. Uh, I'm the bread of life. And so you, you get this whole picture That's right. out of the Gospel of John. But you're right. I like that. Any one of the Gospels, man, you get introduced to Jesus yeah. from his birth. That's right. You know, and all the way to his death. And I like to look at how he interact, interacted with people and how he changed people's lives that he met. And uh, he did. he's a perfect personal worker, you know. He's yeah. perfect. Absolutely. I great like great books. All right, so why did you decide to get into ministry? Well, I wasn't a Christian up to 21. Okay. And at that point, I had visited a lot of churches, you know, growing up. You know, we went to a lot of churches, but it was all so confusing, mass confusion. You know, Methodist Church, Baptist, Catholic, and all. It was just... And so at that point, by the time I was 21, I wanted nothing to do with church, Jesus, Christianity, the Bible. But then I went into a little church of Christ, Mission Church in Nebraska. And I remember the preacher there that day, he got up there and just held up the Bible and just held it up and said, listen, in this world of confusion, we can know the truth. There is just one truth. And that blew me away. And he said, it's the Bible. In the midst of all the religious confusion in the world, we can just put aside all denominational doctrines and man-made creeds. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that appealed to me. Just the Bible. There is one truth. We can know it. And there's just one plan of salvation in Jesus. That's right. And one home in heaven. <laughs> and then he preached the gospel plan of salvation. You know, you just hear, believe, and repent, confess, and are baptized. And said anyone can follow God's plan of salvation. Right. Anybody can understand it, follow it. And then we're just Christians. Mm -hmm. So it blew me away, and I said, man, that's something, I love it. And I just wanted, you know, the day I was baptized is the day I said, I'm also going to get in the ministry. Oh, really? Because I said, everybody needs to hear this. Oh, wow. Because the world is full of that confusion. Yeah. Uh, that people don't know. Uh -huh. That there is just one truth and one book, the Bible, one plan of salvation. You just become Christians. Yeah. So I was so sold, that was it. I was going to be a, a preacher after. That's cool. After that day. You know, and, and, and you're right. Um, this is the standard. Uh, it's, it's where we get our, uh, our start in life. Uh -huh. It's where we get the love of God. Um, it's where we get the idea about what love is. And so it's kind of interesting how so many faith groups uh -huh. have a creed uh -huh. or a pamphlet. You know, you know, here's what you also believe right here. And, That's right. Um, we teach this too. You know, all these things. And and all you need is the Bible. That's right. It's that simple. The it's simplicity simple. of it was just simple. so attractive. He gave us these words, and these words meant to give us life, and mm -hmm. that's it. Anybody can understand it. Anybody can obey it. That's it, man. It's amazing. Yeah. You don't need anything else but the Bible. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, what's the most rewarding thing to you about ministry? It'd be bringing people to the same understanding that I experienced, because mm -hmm. I didn't know where I came from, why I was here, what was my purpose in life? You know, I knew nothing. And so for me to be able to sit and teach people, for them to come to an understanding of where they came from, where they're going, why they're here, and for them to be saved, mm -hmm. it's making an eternal difference in those people's lives. Mm -hmm. Saving their souls forever. I mean, it's just nothing better than that. Saving their souls and knowing that you've affected them for eternity. You know, it's, it's, it's the discipling effect. Mm -hmm. You're in the kingdom because of the guy who taught you. Mm -hmm. Well, he's in the kingdom because the guy that taught him. I taught him. And the guy that taught him probably has no idea who you are. Yeah, that's right. It's amazing. You know? But he'll right. know eventually. He'll know eventually. He'll know one day in heaven. You yeah, know? one person teaching the next and teaching the next. That's it, man. And if, if, we, if we do that, if we disciple, one person teaches the next person, and then they teach the next person, that's right. then uh, the, disciple, the, the, the kingdom expands. Uh, the gates of heaven open That's up right. for new individuals, you know. That's the most rewarding thing is when a person comes to know Jesus and can feel, be filled with that grace and peace. There's nothing like it. Yeah, it, it's, it's great. Know, it changes their life forever. And you know, it's, I've mentioned this before from the pulpit, but people in the church, they need to have that feeling. 
Right. They need to know what it feels like. That's right. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. They need to know what it feels like to right to, to watch somebody be saved. That's right. They they need to know. They need to be ex in the experience, uh, you know, being instrumental of bringing somebody That's to Christ. Right. Because there is no there's no better feeling. No. There's nothing strengthens your faith more than that. That's right. It's like a complete circle, and it strengthens your faith. There's just nothing like it. Yeah, and, and you, you see the storyline behind it. Mm -hmm. If you experience helping lead somebody to Christ, you are now involved, and in the person who led you to Christ, your parents to Christ, your grandparents to Christ, is a part of that story too. That's right. You know, it's a trickle-down effect, the discipleship process. That's right. It's amazing. It, it really is. Okay, on the flip side. Well, sure. let, let me let me mention before you move on. Okay. It's why I got into the ministry. So I went to Sunset School of Preaching in yeah. the 80s, and then I've been a minister ever since. But then 10 years ago, I went to India, mm -hmm. and I saw the thousands of abandoned orphans and children there. So then I directed myself into a specific ministry, mm -hmm. that is, of saving those little kids and putting them into a children's home. And so you were asking what's the most rewarding thing about being in the ministry. Well, the most rewarding thing about being in that particular ministry is saving them physically because a lot of them come in and they're dying. Yeah. Diseases and they're on the verge of death and we get them to the hospitals and get them their, their health back. But then we just teach them about Jesus so they know all about the Bible and Jesus. So that particular ministry is so rewarding because we're saving them physically and spiritually. I like it. So it's, just, it's powerful. It's the greatest thing I've ever done. It's like when, when Jesus fed the 5,000. Uh, on the on the mountainside, or in, in the grassy area, he had everybody sit down. He fed them physically mm -hmm. and spiritually. That's right. You know, he gave them literal bread to eat. That's right. But he also gave them spiritual bread. Come yes, on. that's right. It's very biblical. Okay, so the flip side though, what is the most challenging thing to you about ministry? I guess it's trying to get people to see the truth, mm -hmm. and by that I mean all of us have preconceived ideas. We have a worldview that we grow up with from school, media, parents, we're all taught. And we have this worldview that we all look through. It's like a screen door or a screen window. We have a screen, and as we look out, look into the scriptures or look at, at people or look out in the world, we're looking through that screen. Yeah. Preconceived ideas and a lot of things that are false, false worldviews and that sort of thing. So the hardest thing, the most challenging thing is to get people to somehow... Uh, approach the scriptures with an open mind and an open heart because they come to the to the scriptures with preconceived ideas i mean maybe they were raised catholic let's catholic, say as an example and they have a catholic worldview a catholic screen they're looking through they were raised that way and no matter what it might be so it's very hard to get people to just have an open mind open heart to receive the truth because i presented the truth to a lot of people but you can see they just aren't able to grasp it because of preconceived ideas. They're looking through a screen or worldview that uh, prevents them from really looking at it. One example of that is in India. Uh, Mother Teresa, when she first started going there and rescuing people that were sick and dying off the streets, uh, she experienced a lot of opposition. People said, no, you leave all those people alone that are dying because that's karma. Oh. Reincarnation, that's their screen they're looking through. They're looking through a, a Hindu screen. Right which believes in reincarnation and karma. They said, no, that person's suffering or a little child is suffering because of karma. They were bad in a previous life, so now they're getting what they deserve. So you see the screen they're wearing yeah. it has a huge effect. But in America, if there was a little year-old child or a two-year-old child in the ditch on the highway, every car is going to stop. Yeah. Every car. Right. Not one car would drive by because as a general rule, Americans have a Christian-based worldview. I got you. And they know that human beings are valuable, created in God's image. We must save them. Yeah. So worldview is important. So the question, the most challenging thing in the ministry is trying to get people to, to strip away those falsehoods that are in their worldview and replacing them with biblical worldviews. Which is not new. No. You know, when you think about it, Jesus <laughs> had to battle that. You've got, uh -huh. in, the old, in the New Testament, you've got people who are practicing Jews, and Jesus is preaching to them, uh -huh. and they're coming to him with preconceived ideas. Yeah, already. I'm a child of Abraham. 
cool. and Moses, you know, and and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Judaistic believer and I sacrifice and I go to the temple and Jesus comes there and he's saying, I need you to study with me. Uh -huh. So they approach him and they go into these studies um, with the idea of uh, comparing him to Moses or comparing him to what they've been taught all along. Sure. And so it's, it's something that's not new. No, no, no. It's a continuous battle. Huh? Yeah, we see him. He fought it as well. Some, he could get in. Some would approach him in an open mind, open heart, and respond, and others would walk away. Yeah. So that's the most difficult thing. Okay. Getting, pe getting people to just somehow being able to approach the Bible with an open mind, open heart. And I struggled with it my whole life and will till I die. Hmm. I'm still taking, you know, taking out those faults. Yeah. Thoughts, prejudices, worldviews, and trying to replace them with some biblical truth. So it's all—it's a lifelong struggle. It is. It's, it's a part of the discipleship process. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. Good thoughts. Okay. So last question. Mm -hmm. What topic is the toughest to handle with somebody? Uh, maybe it's the topic of homosexuality and transgenderism. Okay. All that that goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And because, as I just talked about, it's so difficult to get people to approach the Bible with an open mind, I find that those that are involved in the homosexuality or transgenderism are so highly emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. Either they have that temptation or a loved one does, and it's so emotionally charged that it's very difficult to get them to just approach the Bible with an open mind and an open heart to study. That's the difficulty. I feel like it's getting more difficult as the days go by because society has made it mm -hmm. such an okay thing and such a celebratory thing. Yes. A heroic thing. They celebrate you know, when someone, you know, comes out. Yeah, they do. And, and they, you know, they, 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 they create them and they label them a hero, mm -hmm. depending on who you are. Sure. You know, status-wise, uh, some athlete. And brave. Comes, yeah, yeah, very brave. <laughs> some athlete comes out, mm -hmm. he's very mm -hmm. heroic. Or she's very heroic, you know. Yeah. And so we got to battle that now. Yes. That they have donned it as this good thing happening. And uh, and the belief that you're born that way yeah. makes it even more difficult to get them to understand the truth. So, right. Very difficult. Yeah. Which obviously, the, I mean, the Bible teaches us we are not born that way. That's right. You know, it's that's a, again, that's what sin like anything else and temptation. Yes. All temptations are the same and we need yeah. to resist temptation and... But yeah, that's the most difficult topic because of the emotional yeah. charge that's behind it and our society today yeah. and the way that it's viewed. Very difficult. Well, Sherwood, it's been good being with y'all tonight. Um, this has been a good discussion with me, for sure. I mean, <laughs> with Tim, you know, I've enjoyed it. It's been good, good, been good for me. I hope it's been good for you. Tim, thanks for being here, man. Oh, my uh, pleasure, and, man. And, and thanks for opening up your heart and your mind. I love letting, it. Letting us know what's going on. It's I have, great. I've had a good time tonight. Uh, I look forward to many more weeks coming up about this with our shepherds, with Taryn. Um, and so uh, I'm glad that uh, we were able to be here tonight. And uh, anything you want to say real quick before we head off? No, love you guys. See you soon. All right. Hey, well, uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Um, we will see you all again on Sunday. And we hope you all are staying safe, uh, staying warm. And uh, we'll talk to you all later. We'll love you all. Bye-bye.